Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. This is Unit 7, Part 2, and we're going to cover um, wind. And there's just a few slides we'll go through. Um, we're going to look at what the impact of wind is on agroecosystems. Agro and basically, we're going to look at what kind of forces get put on plants or what's exerted on plants and what's that going to mean. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about um, how different particles are transported because of the wind, go through the air. Things like there's pollen, there's salt, there's seeds go from one area to the other. That's why stuff grows in different areas. The seeds will be moved. Um, there's also spores. And I see I have salt listed twice here. So we'll have to correct that slide. And then we're going to look at some of the positive and negative impacts of um, the wind in an agroecosystem. Um, some of the adverse effects that you will have is desiccation, that's um, the, the breaking apart or tearing a plant apart. The wind will just, you know, tear it apart. Um, dwarfing, and that's where, because there's so much wind, it doesn't have the ability to keep growing. It'll bend it over. Um, and the deformation, that's the next one, uh, part of the stuff that happens with that. If there's enough of that, that can occur because when it's going through the process of trying to build new cells, it can't do that. So it'll either be deformed or dwarfed. Um, it can even, if it gets to a certain point, it can cause plant damage by uprooting it and actually pulling it out of the soil. Uh, and it'll change the quality of the air that surrounds the plants. If there's enough wind, it changes whether it's as warm or it's as cool. You can also have erosion of the soil. If the wind is enough, it'll move the soil that is open to the air. Um, if you're close enough to the ocean, uh, you can have problems with having saline soils because that uh, ocean salt will come in from the wind into those areas. So there's some areas you have to have plants that can exist in salt or you just can't grow a whole lot there. And then they can also be a vector for disease and pests. And what a vector is, is something that transports it. So the wind is the vector. So in other words, it gets from one plant to the other, whether it be a disease or a pest, through the wind. There's many other ways it, that there can be vectors, but we're talking about wind right here. Here's just a uh, picture of when we talk about harnessing the wind, things we can do to help. Um, if we take some of that wind, we can put it to good use. In this case, with turbines, you're actually generating electricity. You could use that electricity. You could sell it back to the electric companies, or you could use it on your uh, farm area in order to uh, be more self-sufficient and not use uh, fossil fuels to create the electric that you need. Uh, some of the ways of har harnessing winds also include the use of uh, wind break. And one of the big things on that is a hedgerow, and we'll see a picture of that in a few slides. Um, we can use varied planting techniques, and um, that would be planting more than one crop or the ways we plant it. If we have a wind coming from a certain direction, plant the plants so that they aren't going to be affected as much. <clears throat> um, we can change the timing of the plant. You might have a period of the season where it's more windy or not. Um, we can find, they're always genetically, they're coming up with new varieties of plants. We can try to find resistant plant varieties to wind. And then, of course, in order to help modify the wind a little bit, we can take some of that, although it's not going to take all the wind out of there, and use it for a very good use on either windmills or wind turbines. Here is an example of a hedgerow, and that's all of the uh, growth that's along here. And generally, you will have a buffer zone, they call it. Uh, and here's the farm crop field out there. You can see it's not if it's planted, it's just newly planted. It looks like there's been some tire tr or some tractor marks out there, so they may have just planted this. It's hard to tell from this picture, but you'll have the areas that if it blows, it's going to leave the dirt in that that blows. If, let's say if it's blowing from the west, and we're looking at a north-south shot here, and that hedgerow is going to keep uh, the soil there, so it's not going to uh, go anywhere. It also, if it was coming from the opposite direction, if we were looking to the south, it might be stopping the wind from coming into this area. Uh, and that's another way it would help. Another benefit uh, we've talked a little bit about in the past, but these hedgerows, because you can't really get through them, they're a great area for wildlife, which is also good for your uh, agroecosystem. 
Um, hedgerows, by definition, they're just a strip of trees or shrubs or a herbaceous plant. Herbaceous just means it loses its leaves every year that you plant along borders of the field. <coughs> um, increasing the wildlife habit is a benefit. You decrease that wind damage because it'll stop the wind or keep the uh, soil from going any farther. It'll also, believe it or not, conserve water because water in those areas where we saw the grass, grasses that were there, it will retain more of the moisture so the plants can get some water out of there. Um, you create boundaries and privacy screens, so that could be good for the crops or if you have animals or privacy for yourself. Um, on modifying and harnessing the winds, um, the, ver the variety of ways you can plant plants. <coughs> if you put intercropping, which is planting um, corn and beans together, um, basically it's going to cover an area. You can put melons in an area, but pretty much, and we talked about this in a prior uh, unit, that if you do this, you're probably going to be harvesting by hand because you couldn't get equipment in there to take out melons and then come back in and say take out corn. Um, with this, with the very planting techniques, some of those plants are going to go down deeper in the soil. That's also going to help on winds because if the deeper the roots are, the stronger the plant's going to be for growing. Uh, what that also does is if you have, um, let's say, the melons or the beans, you're going to have more residue left after you harvest. So when you uh, cultivate that into the soil, it's going to add more soil through that, and it's going to have the soil will be a, a, a better soil for you. <coughs> and you could also, in some cases, um, by adding soil, uh, it will create mounding, which is another way to conserve water. The time of planting, you can do crop rotations. Um, if they're prone to wind damage, uh, like I talked a couple slides ago, you, you put them in non-windy periods. If you have soil erosion as an issue, you only open up part of a field. In other words, you're not going to plow it. You're just going to, uh, we talked about planters in the second unit that they now have <coughs> that instead of uh, opening up an area and then planting, you are going to just use the planter to do it. It just opens and closes right away, so you have the residue that's all there, so there's less of a soil erosion issue. And then if you have high residue uh, plants in a more open area, and you have more low residue plants in a high erosion area to help out the process of um, planting and the timing for not losing the soil. Um, using resistant plant varieties, um, for, well, for wind, if you use shorter cultivars, of course, they're not going to be affected as much by the wind. The taller ones, they have more of a you know, weaker structure the taller they get uh, plants, so especially harvestable plants, <coughs> and that would keep you from having a problem. If you get plants with thicker stems, it could make a difference, so they uh, use genetics to create plants that are stronger with thicker stems. And then ones that have deeper root systems. And a lot of the, the root systems, how deep it can get, has to do with what type of soil you have and how well it's able to go down into that or penetrate that soil. Um, here's a picture of, in terms of uh, trying to harness the wind, we're going to use it for, in this case, it's a throwback windmill. And basically, it's just a, a windmill that they used to use many years ago. We're starting to see them again because there uh, used to be they used that for their well. That's how they got their well water. And when they had uh, a lot of uh, livestock, that's how they watered the livestock. They'd be able to turn that on and off, but it would use, they'd use it only when they needed to pump the water out of the well. And this would always spin, but you could disengage it so the water wouldn't be coming out. Um, doesn't do anything with electricity, but it does for bringing the water up from the well. Um, what could you use windmills and turbines for? <clears throat> well, you can generate electricity, especially the turbines. If you were going to do it with the windmill, you would have to have a way to store that power, and a battery is one way you could do that. Um, but pumping water, what I talked about in the prior slide, that old throwback version, uh, it's relatively free in the windy areas. That's relatively free if you don't presume the cost of putting in the windmill or turbine. But over time, it, it in theory, will pay for itself. 
Um, certainly, if you use that, it's a very, very good step in terms of being more sustainable or more green. Um, sustainability of the wind, um, it's certainly an important component of the uh, weather on, for the wind, but you can have destructive uh, things occur with the wind. But if you properly design your agroecosystem, in other words, with hedgerows, uh, you're going to be more capable of withstanding and controlling those winds. Um, so you can have positive aspects. You can also um, do things with the wind-resistant plants, the shorter versions of it, or they have the thicker stocks that will help you um, have less of a problem. And here are the pictures that we saw in this portion of the unit, part two.